Do you know that there is only one God in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you know that Jesus said he is the only way to heaven, and his death and resurrection bring forgiveness of sins to all who believe? Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study God's Word, the Bible, together. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. Do you know what a Methodist is? This is my copy of John Wesley's diary. In the 1700s, John Wesley on horseback went town to town all over England preaching the gospel. They'd beat him up in one town, he'd just go to the next, and it's great to read his diary. A godly man of God. Well, he founded the Methodist Church. Thousands came to conversion. And so today, though, if, if John Wesley could see what has happened to the United Methodist Church, he would weep. I'm a Lutheran. I normally talk to you about how Martin Luther would weep if he could see what happened to the ELCA Lutheran Church. But the reason I believe in the devil, the same demons that are destroying the United Methodist Church, the ELCA Lutheran Church, Presbyterian Church USA, the United Church of Christ, and the Episcopal Church, a feminist goddess that we're supposed to worship, Unitar uh, a, a view that everybody goes to heaven. It's called universalism. You don't need to believe in Christ. Uh, the gay stuff, the transgender stuff. Churches promoting abortion rights. So now the United Methodist Church is splitting. So we brought an expert in, and I want to introduce you to Pastor Paul Mar Marzan. Marzan, yes. Thank you, Paul, for coming, because you're in the United Methodist, and you recently led your church out. Am I right? It's a sadness in my heart, but it's true. We were, you know, one of the first ones in the uh, state of Minnesota, but also one of the first in the nation to leave, and now 6,000 more have left since then. Nationally. Nationally. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about the split in the United Methodist Church. So let's pray before we begin. Father, we pray for the Methodists now that are going through what the Lutherans, Presbyterians, the United Church of Christ, the Episcopalians, they went through this about 10 or 20 years ago. Now the United Methodists. Lord, we pray that people would have their eyes open and that Methodists who love you would take a stand and, and leave that denomination if they need to. God, we pray your Holy Spirit to be with Paul and I as we discuss this issue. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul, before we launch into this topic, I always like to ask our interviewees, <laughs> how did you come to know Christ? Uh, I was very blessed. I grew up in a Christian family, so I was baptized United Methodist, um, and then was raised on a farm with uh, two loving parents who took me to church every Sunday, Sunday school, uh, prayer meetings sometimes at the Baptist church if we were really feeling spiritual. <laughs> um, and actually that Baptist church and our church took a bus up to the Twin Cities to go see Billy Graham. And I was there at the state fairgrounds, and I remember the song was playing, Just As I Am Without One Plea, and the Spirit called me forward, and I knelt down at the altar at the front, and Billy Graham touched me and several others as he prayed over us in the, in the front. And as John Wesley would say, I felt my heart strangely warmed. There you go. And uh, from that time on, I felt really on fire for God. Wonderful. And you, you never fell away. You've been a Christian the whole time. Yep. And Wonderful. Yeah, I've been very And now blessed. you're a pastor for... Like 30 years or so? 40 years. I started yeah, wow. when I was out of high wow. school. Yeah. Well, you know, let, let me ask this question. The ELCA Lutherans ordained homosexual, practicing homosexuals in 2009. The, the United Church of Christ even earlier. And, but the United Methodists have been known for being pretty liberal. But they haven't been able to get through the pro-gay stuff until just recently. Explain why. Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, I grew up United Methodist, but the truth is I kind of was half and half. I was baptized EUB, they called it, back in the early days. But in 1968, the Evangelical United Brethren, or the German Methodists, merged with the English-speaking Methodists, but it's about time, right? It's 1968. <laughs> okay. So they all came together. There's about 4 million conservatives and maybe 6 million more moderates or progressives. And so there was still a fairly equal balance. Um, and then likewise, the mission work around the world was, was booming and is still booming. And so really the international community, which we are a worldwide organization, similar to Roman Catholicism, is more conservative. And so if you look at maybe those overseas as well as those that are more conservative in the United States, they way outnumber those who are either moderate or progressive. So have I got this right? Most United Methodist leaders are liberal. They've been wanting to get to the gay stuff through 
practicing homosexual pastors for decades, but they can't because they let the conservative Methodists from Asia and Africa vote every four years, and they can't get it through. So finally, the liberals have decided to split the church. That's pr pretty much it. They've um, the votes were lost in 2016, where they thought, well, now we finally have enough votes, and we've been lobbying, and we have all the resolutions, and and they, you know, all these kind of things that we're going to try. That didn't work. So then they had a special convention. They said, let's not deal with it every four years like we've been doing. Let's let's put together a task force, and the bishop put a proposal together. Yeah, I know. The this. bishop's proposal was rejected. Yeah. And in 2018, they said, let's stay the course. But the bishops didn't stay the course. They rejected what the people voted and have now broken covenant. And so they no longer follow our book of discipline. So does the United Methodist Church at this moment ordain practicing homosexuals? Um, some states do very openly. Some states do with a wink, wink. We're not going to ask and don't tell. Tell people, though, what I read your bishop said about conservatives. You can believe your conservative beliefs, but if you can't do a gay wedding, you have to find a pastor who will. Am I right? That is correct. Our, our bishop and many others around the United States have come up with a policy of um, where they, they say that you don't have to give up your conscience, but the church has to do these unions. So therefore, you have to provide a way to facilitate them. If that means getting another partner that's a pastor or allowing your building to be used by those that would like to do this kind of work. So if you think it's a sin, okay, you can think that, but you gotta, you got to help us sin here and find a gay, uh, a gay person who, uh, a person who married. I don't think they word it that way, but no. I think that's what, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and then tell people, you were telling me before the cameras rolled about how you had to publicly challenge one of the bishops. Tell yeah. me that story. Well, I think there's several times I've challenged the bishops, but this one was a little more public. And I think it was just sad. I, I'm known in my conference, we have one every, every year up at the state convention. And um, I often get up and read scripture and I will, will do that. And I remember the bishop ruling me out of order. And I said, no, sir, you're out of order. And I, and I had to kind of call out what was happening at that time, which was they were making resolutions that were against our book of discipline. And our Book of Discipline isn't decided state by state. It started, it's um, decided internationally. And so local churches and state organizations can't change doctrine. And he was changing doctrine. Yes, they were making policy decisions that day that were not based on and, what they're supposed to change. And so he's still the bishop? Well, um, he's retired now. All right. <laughs> uh, so it's, and it's not just the issue of whether we're going to bless gay relationships. There are other issues that are dividing yeah. your church as it was in the church I used to serve before I left the ELCA. What are the other issues? Yeah, and when we left, we actually brought up 10 issues. I won't get into all of them. One, first and foremost was just the authority of Scripture. Um, the authority of Scripture has been watered down as one book among many. Universalism, where there's no longer the doctrine of heaven and hell. Atonement theory has been thrown out for many of these churches. Yeah. And I would even say financial mismanagement. Okay. Um, one of the policy that I was challenging was when you sell a church in a denomination, that money is supposed to go to plant new churches. Okay. And uh, there's kind of this trust clause that talks about that. Well, many of those resources are being used for other things, staffing, trustees issues, all these things. And so the lockbox of we take money and put it into church planting has kind of deteriorated. So are there any, uh, let's say I'm a United Methodist, I want to leave this denomination that is becoming so heretical. Are there good Methodist denominations other than the United Methodists, I can join. Absolutely. I mean, there's the ones that were in existence for a while, like the, the, the Wesleyans have always kind of been around. There's the Free Methodists. Yes. Um, all these have been around for several years. And those are often groups that kind of said, we're not going to join the United Methodists when the merger happened okay. in 68. Uh -huh. I like the AME, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. They, they got great worship. <laughs> okay. But the newest one for me is the Global Methodist Church. And the Global Methodist Church says, we want to keep what's best about United Methodism, which is our international community. And so the Global Methodist Church has been working really hard to work with like Indonesian and the Philippines and the Koreans and all of our overseas brothers and sisters around the world to say we would like to stay united together in a different way and think of ourselves as a global church. And so I'm excited by that, uh, the Global Methodist Church. So if I'm a Methodist pastor and my people have had enough of this for decades and we want to leave the United Methodist Church, can we keep our property? How does this work? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, Part of what the United Methodist Church was founded on by John Wesley was they said we have a trust clause where the denomination owns the building. If the church dissolves, it goes back to the denomination. Or if a body decides to become heretical 
and decides to leave. Well, they can leave, but they got to leave their building behind. <laughs> the irony is the heresy has now <laughs> from the top down, yeah. and those that want to keep their buildings are the ones holding the doctrine. Huh. So this is what's so... As if, Mark, <laughs> as if John Wesley would be favor of gay pastors. And, yeah, it, it's just gone upside down. So uh, depending <coughs> on the, the state or the, you know, the, every conference is what we call them, like the Dakotas, it's a dollar to get out. Okay. You know, and, and there's hundreds of uh, churches that have left there. In Minnesota, they came up with this uh, different, I call it ransom fee, but it's based on loosely a connection with our pension program. So, for example, our church was off, asked to pay $350,000 to leave. A smaller church might be asked anywhere between eighty and 150000 um, wow. And so it's complicated. I won't get into it here. But I would say that the fee structures are unfair. And I don't think that they're truthful in the numbers that they're giving from the Pension Society and, either. And can you imagine what John Wesley would say? You have to pay $350,000 to leave because you're against universalism, homosexuality, worshiping the goddess mother of feminism. And again, it's upside down. It's very upside down. Are there any conservative Methodist bishops left? There are quite a few, actually. And, and I think they're staying in it to see what happens in the 2024 new general conference. Okay. Um, the general conference still has said that we are in favor of holding our doctrine. It's not been voted out yet. And so some of those bishops are holding on to say, hey, we need to stick to the doctrine we've all promised to stick to. And others, I think, are sticking around to say, well, if there is a compromise, there's something called the protocol that they would like to bring forward where churches can leave easier and churches can leave after 2023, that this will be uh, still an exodus period. And I think those bishops that are, are more conservative want to stay in charge so they can allow more churches to leave. How many have left so far? A little over 6,000. Wow. And that's just in the United States. Wow. So worldwide, we know that there's a, a bigger group going. That'll, uh, Am I wrong, though? <clears throat> I mean, I, I have a friend who, uh, whose mother goes to a United Methodist Church in a small town in Iowa, and I said to him, any chance of them leaving? And he said, nope. Yeah. Am, am I right? And it's not that it's a liberal congregation. They just have always been United Methodist. It's, am I right that most will probably stay? Yeah, it's just institutionalism. Instead of really doing an up and down vote, do you want to be this or this? They just said, if you do nothing, you're staying. Yeah. So you have to get a two-thirds vote of your church to leave. Okay. You have to pay a huge fee. You have to go through a year of discernment, all these hoops to jump. And a lot of them just like, eh, we're not going to do that. But what they don't realize is that nice hometown pastor they have now and the situation they have is going to change probably after 2024. No kidding. And doctrines will change. The way they do church will change. Yeah. And eventually even their favorite old hymns will go away yeah. and they'll sing new hymns that have different doctrine. Let me give you an example. I was ELCA Lutheran. I led my congregation out and now they're part of what's called the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations. Yeah. They're getting good pastors. But I know a, pa a church in Roseville, Minnesota, years ago they had a wonderful biblical pastor. They stayed in. Now they have a transgender pastor. So if you don't, I mean, I don't see how people can stay a pastor in the ELCA knowing that they're going to get liberal pastors following. And not necessarily, but very possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so if uh, with this division in the United Methodist Church, all the seminaries they own, who's going to keep those? Property is still going to be a battle. Right now, until 2024, we're all good, friendly neighbors, right? Yeah. But at some point when they decides to be an official voted on split, there's, you know, hospitals, there's properties, there's universities, there's seminaries. Who's going to get all that? And so some of those are already have pulled away and said, no matter what happens, we're not Methodist anymore uh, we were, because we're more conservative or we're not United Methodist. Or, you know, mm -hmm. So they're starting to see the right in the wall. Even like Hamlin University, where I was a graduate, has no longer be a Methodist connection that same way, yeah. at least on the legal side. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you what you say, and then I'll give my 10 cents. <laughs> when, when a Lutheran or a Methodist says, well, you know, I, I believe in staying and fighting, mm -hmm. and shouldn't we stay and fight and not hand them to seminaries and everything, what would you say? Yeah, I think those are great questions. I always say, Where, where's God calling you? I never want to judge another pastor who's really trying to stand for God. Um, but it's, there are some points where you can be not helpful in your own ministry locally yeah. and even make a difference nationally or statewide. So yeah. there was a point where I had to ask that same question. Am I going to be 
uh, more helpful to plant what's new and what's going to really bring more people to Jesus or am it going to be more helpful to stay and continue the fight, which I have been doing for 40 years, if you will. Yep. And, and you know, if I can piggyback on that, I stayed in the ELCA for many, many years trying to help with other pastors to turn that thing around. And then it, it just wouldn't turn around. And then it went off the cliff in 2009 when the tornado hit the convention, <laughs> yep. for those that know that story. And, and ever since 2009, they, they're not liberal anymore. They're radical. They had the world's first transgender bishop. Uh, the head bishop says that she thinks hell is empty. You know, so everybody goes to heaven. You don't need to believe in Christ. It comes to a point where, for the sake of the sheep, you got to get them into a good denomination. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's the new forming, and we're going to put your phone number up on the screen here, Paul. If you have a question about how do you get your church out, or how do we talk to our pastor or the church council, we're going to put Paul's phone number up on the screen. And uh, do we have it there? Um, Paul Marzan, he doesn't mind you calling, 612, <laughs> I cast him that, I wouldn't do this, but there you go, uh, God, God bless you, Paul. Uh, Paul Marzan, 612-799-PRAY, and he will be glad, and this program goes all over the country now, and there's lots of Methodists all over the country. If you want to get your church out, or you want somebody to talk to about how do we do this, here's the man, Paul Marzan, <laughs> and how much time do we have left? I'm sorry, the, the, the clock is not running. So what have we got? 11.30. 11.30. We got 11 minutes left? I don't think so. <laughs> oh, well, how are you, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let's get into this now. Let's leave behind this negative stuff, yeah. and let's talk about John Wesley. I All right. love that. What are the distinctives of the Methodist Wesleyan church? Yeah, there's so many great things that John Wesley did. One that he talked about was the, the Wesleyan quadrilateral, where he talked about scripture is interpreted through experience, reason, and tradition. Many people don't know that John Wesley was also a doctor. He wrote medicinal books and oh, so he forth. Did. Yeah, he made actually more of his money handing out these little pamphlets on health, and that was funded a lot of his ministry when he got kind of kicked out of his local church. Oh. And what John Wesley also did was, he, it was kind of this age of the church was against science. He was one of the first pastors that said, well, science and enlightenment and religion can all work together. So he said we'd look at scripture with our experience, our reason. We don't need to throw out our intellect just because we are believers. And then tradition, we don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So he'd made some changes, like let's sing maybe a few bar tunes to some Christian words. Yeah, Luther did that too. Yeah, but yeah. he said but it's still the tradition of communion, still the tradition of baptism, still the con tradition of con confirmation and okay. ordination. So okay. he tried to blend all that, some really good distinctives. He was a, a big fan of Luther, not such a big fan of Calvin. Uh, <laughs> more of an Arminian flavor, yeah, if you yeah, will. Yeah. Um, but he also Which was- Which means free will. He was also big yeah. on social holiness. We think of social justice. And he did social justice work, but it wasn't in the same way we think of it. When he used the term personal piety and social holiness, he says it's our spiritual journey with God that draws us to do holy works for God. He was against child labor laws back in England at that time where they were taking kids and putting them in factories. He was against all the trafficking of women way back in the day. He started soup kitchens. And in fact, a lot of things like the Salvation Army came from the Wesleyan movement. Mm -hmm. And so he was really one of the first church leaders to say publicly, we need to care for the poor. That was one of his biggest critiques against the Anglican church was this huge houses that the pastors lived in, the amount of money they made, and yet they gave very little to the poor. Talk to me about the method, why they call it the Methodist church. What's the method? Yeah, so when Wesley was in college, he was at Oxford, and they created these what were called um, holiness clubs. And they kind of made fun of them because they would get up early at 5 a.m. in the morning and pray, and they had this method of growing close to God through the spiritual disciplines, like fasting, you know, prayer, scripture reading, and a big one was accountability. Yes. You would spend time in an accountability group where you would confess your sins to one another, yeah. and you would work on maturing your faith. Yeah. And so they made fun of him and said, oh, you got a method to be a Christian. And he said, well, yes, we actually do. Yeah. We feel forth methodical in our faithful walk. We can grow more mature in Christ. Amen. And you know, how do you get over a sinful habit? You don't do that by yourself. You need a little group, or at least you need a confidant, a, a 
prayer partner who every week says, how did you do with uh, the internet this week? Yeah. Did you pray this week? How did you treat your family? Did you give money to the Lord? This, you know, w if we don't have accountability, we're going to keep sinning in our habitual sins. But you get a little group, a Methodist <laughs> group. Are, are there Methodist groups that still Absolute. left? Oh, yeah. There's, there's Accountable kind of discipleship still a big movement in the Methodist movement. Uh, I love the last question he asked. He had a series of questions he recommended. The last one was, have you just lied to me? Yeah, there you go. That's my favorite. It's like, <laughs> oh, maybe uh, I uh, just didn't uh, say the whole truth. Yeah, you know? yeah. So if the Methodist church would get back to the method, oh. it would be wonderful. Yeah. So and our, in our brand of United Methodism, and it's actually in our book of discipline, to be a church member, you have to be in a small group. We really? have a commitment card we fill out every year, not just with their financial pledge, we say, how many times do you anticipate being in worship this year? Because that was one of the commitments he used to ask. He used to ask, how many times do you plan on sharing your salvation story this year? This is, this is uh, Wesley? This is Wesley. He used to ask these oh. questions. And then, where are you serving? You know, where are you using your abilities or spiritual gifts? And then, where are you giving your finances? All right. Uh, so those accountabilities really hold a member. Wow. So you used to, way back when, you used to get your communion card at your small group meeting, and then you brought that to church on Sunday. Wow. Way back in the day. Wow. Mm -hmm. how, how we have fallen. So uh, you're a Methodist, I'm a Lutheran, and we agree there's one God and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Absolutely, yeah. We agree Jesus is fully God and fully man. Uh, you mentioned earlier the atonement. We believe Christ died in our place for our sins. It's called substitutionary atonement. atonement. That's what liberals don't like, some of them. Yes. Uh, we believe in his bodily, physical, literal resurrection from the dead, yep. his second coming. Um, I believe we're saved by grace alone, not good works. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. All right. So, but from good, But he would say, but from, this is critique of Luther's, but from good works, and from grace, works flow. I agree. And, and I think yeah. Luther would agree too. So I, he had to kind of push yeah, against the Catholic yeah. Church. Now, some of the holiness groups, I got a problem. <laughs> because, I mean, I remember one of these, this guy claims he hadn't sinned for years. I thought, what planet yeah. is he on? And I, can, I wrote a whole paper on Wesley's perfectionism. Or explain so, it to Yeah, us. so that is a, a doctrine. It's a little different. It's called entire sanctification. He did several sermons on it. And basically, it gets misnomered and misunderstood. So when he meant entire sanctification, he did not mean sinless, not in the way we think of it. Yeah. What, think about when you're in a really great worship service and you're praising God and you're focused on it, or you're preaching a message and you're really listening to the Holy Spirit. You're lined with God for that moment. And I would say you were probably sinless or so focused on God, God has taken over your, your sense of being. Okay. So whether it be in worship, whether it be, I think it can happen in service. There have been times when I've been working, I feed my starving children, I'm scooping the rice and having the thing. I'm only focused on God and helping others. But there are other times when I'm not. Well, would you agree with this? We sin in thought, word, and deed daily. Do you mm -hmm. think that's true? Yeah. All right. So well, entire sanctification is how do I take those moments of perfection yeah. or entire sanctification and I stretch them out. Okay. Stretch them out. Okay. Stretch them out. And, okay. and the, so that was what Wesley's challenge was with the small groups is how do you work on entire sanctification as a goal? Okay. One, one disagreement we won't get into, but let's, <laughs> let's mention it because we'll take another half an <laughs> yes, hour. Yes, I don't believe in free will. I believe in predestination. Okay. That you cannot, on my own power, come to Christ. You're a tulip guy, right? I, I'm not a tulip, but I'm but close. You're a tulip. I, that, that, <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I, I don't like the talk of uh, of a limited atonement. Other yeah, than that, yeah. I'm kind of close. But the, the Wesleyan movement is is bigger on free will. It really yeah, is. It's, yeah. But I think that really the challenge why is they wanted John Edwards was a partner of, of John Wesley and a great preacher, is to ask people. Are you saved? Yeah. It's the challenge to say that we don't know. So therefore, we're going to ask everybody. And I think there are some, not all, but some Calvinistic or uh, predestination people say, well, we don't need to ask because no matter what, God's going to draw them to himself. Yeah. And I think that's a downside okay. of some of the predestination is we take our own responsibility of sharing the gospel away. Okay. And I think Wesley wants to share the gospel. Okay. Okay, good. Well, you know, I'm sorry, everybody, to do this. How much time have we got left? The, the, the thing isn't rolling. Four minutes. Four minutes. How are you, Paul? <laughs> well, good. And, and I, let's just reiterate, though. Paul, you're a Methodist. I'm a Lutheran. Sum up again, what are the divisions going on? What are the issues in the United Methodist Church? I'm going to guess the same ones, but go ahead. What are the, reiterate why churches are feeling they have to leave the United Methodist Church. I feel that uh, churches that are leaving are feeling they have to leave because they there's an escape clause available to them. In the 2019 uh, General Conference, they put an escape clause in hoping that the progressives would leave. 
What's interesting is they did leave. For about six months, they tried to form a new denomination. But it was so chaotic, so disorganized. And in fact, even some of the founders said, we don't need clergy, which made people really frustrated. They started it because they're like, well, how are we going to have jobs? <laughs> and so they, they still have a Facebook page. They finally took down in a website, um, and it had you know, some kind of X's in it out over all the, the denominational stuff they threw in there. But it didn't work. And so after about a year, they just said, we can't form our own thing. So they all went back to the Methodist. And they're movement. taking over the whole denomination. And so the new, th the, yeah, the new pattern then was, well, we're just going to be disruptive. We're going to continue to live out what we want to live out within the denomination and be disruptive to the point where we'll force out others to leave. And they're pretty much in charge, aren't they? Um, a lot of them are. And they're getting their way. They're getting they? their way. There's nobody really standing up to them on the bishop's council, the judicial council, or the hierarchy that should be really holding them accountable. Is there going to be one more vote on the homosexual stuff or not? There'll be a vote on a whole number of things in 2024. And, and that's probably when you really have to leave, am I right? Correct. And the difficulty is we don't know what will happen. The window for leaving, which was set up in 2019, ends. For conservatives, for con mainly. Well, it was actually set up for the liberals to leave and the conservatives to stay. Oh, I but see. But none of them left. So when they stayed, the conservatives basically said, oh, we can't deal oh. with the, we, we're done. Man. So let's just, let's us leave because they're never going to leave. And that's kind of what happened. And so the, those that wanted to form the Global Methodist Church or just leave and become independent left in droves. Like I said, over 6,000. So if they've all left and then still worldwide churches have left, um, what's going to be the vote? to really hold this thing together. It's, it's, it's the, the, just the liberals will vote. Yeah. And that, that's what happened in the ELCA Lutheran Church. 2009, they voted in the pro-gay stuff. And a lot of churches left, but most stayed. And now, ever since 2009, that denomination is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Because you, you can, people will still vote with their feet. Yeah. Regardless if their church leaves, they can still choose to leave. Yeah. The biggest difference between the ELCA and the, the United Methodist is the property. And so we're held in trust. So it's really difficult because there's a huge price tag maybe after 2024. Yeah. For anyone who wants to leave, they may have to pay the price of their building. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, now we've got one minute left. I've got, <laughs> finally, I, had, I got my timer in front of me. But everybody, well, I want to thank you so much, Thank Paul. you so much. And Paul, you're the pastor at what church? Crossroads Church of Minnesota. In Lakeville. In Lakeville. And yeah. let's put his phone number back up. Maybe you're a United Methodist and you're watching this in Ohio or California and you want your church to know what's going on. Because a lot of pastors don't bring this up in the pulpit. That's my experience. And you want to talk to somebody. So feel free to call Pastor Ma Paul Marzan, 612-799-PRAY. Let's do that. Let's real quick pray. God the Father, we pray that many, many United Methodists would stand up for your truth, somehow do a miracle. And may the, those that honor your word win and those that are dishonoring you repent. But Lord, we would pray that you would just do a mighty work in the United Methodist Church. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because of the generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.